co-founder and president of 23andMe. Partnerships, I would always recommend a partnership because for me it's, it seemed like, you know, when Linda and I first met, we came together and said we have no ego, we really want, we just want to make this happen. And we, we worked at an amazing schedule where, you know, I tend to go to bed late, Linda wakes up really early. So we actually worked almost 24-7 for, for years. And, um, and we got an amazing amount of stuff done. And the contacts, I had a, a tremendously different number of contacts than Linda had. And we were really able to, I think, get, you know, the kind of marketing reach and the kind of, um, you know, publicity because we came from different worlds but had such similar ideas. Um, so. It was, you know, it's perfect. It's, it's, it's really, it's to do a startup when you only have five people, and and um, you need to, you need to, you need to make such an impact. And especially with genetics, personal genetics, there's so many people to talk to. So, um, so I have to say, we did a really, you know, I'm really proud of what we did. It was, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we had a really great time, and and I'm actually very excited about the idea of working with Linda in the Alzheimer's um, initiative that she's taking on because I think it's it's the culmination of exactly what we've done. We both have personal interests about what we want to do, and now 23andMe has built this platform to do you know consumer directed research initiatives, and and Linda's executing on that. And you know Alzheimer's is going to be her first initiative. She has other diseases that she wants to go after, and I think it's to me it's it's a great moment. The fact that we you, you actually feel comfortable enough to leave and and say I'm gonna I'm gonna you know take on my own personal health issues that I really want to work on. Um, in terms of being two women, um, it's you know I think neither of us really thought about it that much. We both worked in in industries where it's been you know either you know male dominated or. Um, or, or you know, someone makes you know. It, the questions come up, and we never really thought about it that much. Um, it's more that people ask us about it a lot, um, and that there's conferences like the, f you know, Fortune Most Powerful Women's Conference. Like it's really fun, um, but I find that people then end up talking a lot about like, oh, what's it like to be a woman? And and to be honest, for me, the biggest change was that there was a line in the bathroom. Um, so, but other, but other than that, you know, it was, it was great. It was great when we had more people who were all pregnant at the same time, and everyone was could commiserate about breastfeeding, you know, like, which I guess is unique. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, we never really thought about that much. Well, I'd say Twenty Three and Me is so, as much as we have the reputation for being the consumer oriented company, and we are consumer oriented, we're so heavy on the science. Um, that to us it was it was sort of obvious. You know, of course you're going to want your genetic information. We all want our genetic information. Why would you not want genetic information? Um, and I think that that's probably something that we we underestimated in terms of the fact that people don't really necessarily know exactly why. You know, what what do they want to do with their info? What do they want to do with the genetic information? Um, why would they want it? And and creating. You know, I think about other industries where it's been a big technology shift, so something like TiVo. TiVo was a big shift in, in how people watch TV, but everyone understood the concept of TV. No one really understands the concept of, well, why would I want my genetic information? And, and I think one of the other big challenges that we have is that people, um, healthcare is not a true industry, healthcare is not a true free market because you are used to going to your doctor and saying you want X, Y, and Z and not paying for it. And, and so for that reason, us telling people, wow, you can get access to your genetic information, it's much cheaper than, you know, some of the other ways you could get it, and it's all within your control, that, that's actually a, a hard leap for a lot of people because they're not used to paying for anything for healthcare. So it's one of the things that we found, we've discovered that we have to educate people a lot more um, about, you know, preventative care, why they should actually invest in that, um, and what are things that they should do with the information, and the fact that they actually are going to have to take a lot more responsibility for, for their health. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty big adjustment for people. I think there's huge, there's huge questions to, to deal with. Um, it was funny, early on in the company, we engaged with a number of different bioethicists, um, and we actually talked about employing someone, and then we, we actually couldn't get anyone to join because everyone found that this topic was so interesting that they felt that they, this was going to be pivotal to their academic career. So, um, so we've engaged with a number of people, and we've gotten them to you know, always give us feedback on it. Um, but fundamentally, one of the things we've realized, it's an, it's an incredibly interesting area for the ethics community to talk about. Um, you know, fundamentally, what 
23andMe believes is that it's really about choice. And if you want to get access to something that is fundamentally yours, we believe it's your right to get access to it. Um, it's not for everyone. That's abundantly clear to us. And those people should not have to do it. And so, you know, 23andMe really wants to encourage the debate. Um, we want to encourage the debate. We want to be a participant in it. We want to be supportive of it. Um, and I think we remain very firm in that we believe individuals should have the right to get access to this information um, and how it's going to be used um, and what are the right, what are the good things and what are the bad things that society really needs to have that debate. And 23andMe will be there, but it's society to should put the limits on it. We launched the Parkinson's Initiative with Michael J. Fox and the Parkinson's Institute in, out here. And we have individuals with Parkinson's were given a discounted version of uh, the 23andMe. So we've designed the 23andMe site so that individuals can get access to their data. Um, they can fill out surveys specifically about Parkinson's as well as about their general health. Um, and they get all the other access, so in information about their ancestry. They can connect and share with individuals. There's a community portion. They can learn from people. So we want to have a really engaging experience for people so that we can keep getting information from them. So we have one Parkinson's survey now, we will plan to have additional Parkinson's surveys because the long-term goal is how do I get information about you today? But let's say I want to know how does your Parkinson's progress in 12 months, in 24 months, in 48 months, because that information will be really valuable to correlate with your genetic information. So then comes in 23 and We on the back end, our researchers in-house are actually analyzing all the data. So all the information that we're collecting through the surveys, they then compare with the genetic information information and what we're finding is we're actually making really interesting discoveries so um, on all the different questions that we're asking about so we'll hope to announce soon information about you know because this Parkinson's community came together what are some of the discoveries that we have made and what are those discoveries what kinds of discoveries will benefit that community so that might also integrate with a lot of the clinical trials that are happening where clinical trials are happening you know either on drugs where we can potentially help figure out why some people respond, some people don't respond, um, what, where there's toxicity or there's not toxicity. Um, and some, a lot of the Parkinson's patients are eager to participate in clinical trials. So we might be able to help make sure that they're, they can find a clinical trial that makes sense for them. I think the biggest problem in clinical trials is that they're underpowered and that fundamentally the, the studies are just too small. And they're designed in such a way, because they're so expensive, they're designed in such a way that they're just, there's a small cushion. Um, and so, you know, they're expensive to run. If you need, if you need a thousand patients to really get the, clint, the, the power that you're looking for, maybe you have 1,100. Um, but what we're finding is that those actually are still underpowered. So the advantage of 23andMe that we can do is we can actually have huge data sets where we're not looking to collect, you know, 100 people with cancer or 1,000 people with, you know, multiple sclerosis. We want you know, tens of thousands. So the Parkinson's initiative we've announced, you know, we have over 3,000 people with Parkinson's in it, which is, you know, on a relative basis, one of the largest cohorts out there now. So we're looking to develop these large cohorts and keep asking questions. Um, I think one of the other advantages that we have is that we can ask these Parkinson's patients about their Parkinson's, but we're also learning about all these other aspects of them. So we ask the general health survey, and then we're asking about commonly used drugs. So, you know, do they get a stomach ache when they take Advil? How do they respond to Benadryl? Things like that. So it's a cohort where we can keep learning more and more things from them. I think we're very focused on developing um, or understanding the, the relationship between genetics and drug response. And so that could be either on the efficacy side or the safety side. But, you know, there's, it's a well-known studies that have come out that said 50% of all drugs that we take have no effect on you. So what we would like to understand is if you're given a drug, is it going to respond? Yes or no. And is it going to be safe? Yes or no. And that's going to be a, a critical mission of 23andMe. To me, it's very interesting that it's so controversial, the fact that it's, it's, it's not deterministic. Um, because throughout my life in medicine, I have never, I very rarely get a test back that is so deterministic. So, you know, even when I was pregnant and, and I get a variety of tests back and they say, okay, you're, this is cutting your risk down for having a Down syndrome baby, but it's never, it's never 100%, um, unless I did the amnio, which I did not do. So, you know, I've, I've, and even things like cholesterol, if I, if, if I find out I have high cholesterol, 
Again, that's a risk base. It means that I have a risk factor for heart disease, but it, it didn't tell me anything specific. It doesn't, you know, some people even do very well with having high cholesterol. It doesn't say specifically you are going to die of, of heart disease. Um, so in my opinion, my, you know, I've been very comfortable with having diagnostic tests that, that tell me that I might be at higher risk or lower risk based on some, some information. So for the LERC2 example that my husband has, he already knew that he had a family history of Parkinson's disease, and now he knows that there is a genetic basis for it and that he carries that genetic basis for it. So, you know, again, he already knew that there was the family history. He has it there, and he has gone through a lot of the literature. One of the things that he's found is that it's not that well studied just yet because it was a relatively recent discovery, um, but there is information there about things you can do to prevent Parkinson's. So that could be changing your diet, exercising more, and potentially drinking coffee. Um, and those are all three things that he does. And, and again, going to the critics, all three of those things are great for his health regardless. So he has lost weight, he is much more vigilant about um, you know, eating vegetables, and he is trying to drink a little bit of coffee. So, so I'm, really, you know, I'm really happy that we got that information because even if it comes out later that, oh, he has other genes that um, you know, decrease his risk and therefore he's sort of at average risk for Parkinson's, you know, one, I'm used to getting that inf kind of information and that kind of change in, in healthcare. And two, I'm happy because he made a lifestyle change that fundamentally made him healthier. The moral values that, and the ethics that, that Google has definitely influenced. You know, I think when Sergey and Larry started the company, they really, you know, they were, they were very, like, they weren't in it for the money. They started it because they really wanted to create something that, one, they wanted, and two, they thought was going to change the world. Um, and, and, and I think that, that that really held up with 23andMe, where we say all the time, you know, we're not, we're not here just to be, it would be very easy for us to say, oh, we just want to be another kind of diagnostic company, we come out with something very simple. Um, we really want to change the landscape. Um, you know, every single day we want, to, we want to take on the hard problems. We don't want to just, um, you know, find a solution and, and make money and, and, and leave it at that. We really want to keep evolving and take on those hard problems. So I think that Google's been really inspiring in that way and that they keep, um, you know, things like the, the book settlement, like even, you know, all these things that they're doing, I'm, I'm continuously impressed by the challenges that they take on. And, and I hope that the same thing happens for 23andMe. The amount of information. Um, I think it's, we definitely are suffering from an information overload, but I believe that there's going to be better and better ways of organizing that information and processing it so, so that it's, it will enhance your daily life. So even things we were playing, um, we have this happen now, sort of once, once a week I'll go through on Google Earth and go sort of essentially fly into a different city. And, and we have this large monitor at home, and it's amazing resolution. And, and I was in Tibet in 2000, and I could just walk around the streets. And, and it's things like that, it's not, um, you know, that it be, now that I have a small child and I can't travel as much, that's phenomenally, it's phenomenally interesting for me, it's fun. Um, and I think that that's how information and technology just are gonna impact our lives more and more on the, on the personal and on the fun side, and more and more I think also on, um, on the serious, I think on the medical side, I think we're gonna get, I'm really excited about radiology. I think I'm, I, I've never seen, there's a, there's a conference in Chicago every, um, every October, and the stuff that's happening in radiology is fascinating. And the stuff you can do with imaging, and I just think that technology and information is, it's overwhelming at the moment, but I think it's really going to have a major, um, it's really going to make life better. To be honest, since being a new mother, the, my, my biggest concern becomes, is the health. Um, you know, coming, if I was diagnosed with something, um, you know, that was fatal in the next couple of years, I, I can't imagine anything more uh, terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so for me, health, health is, we know a lot about technology and we know a lot about, you know, the world, but I think health is the one area where I find that it's still, it's, there's so much data, but it's chaotic and, and that it's still a big black box. So understanding really what, what's going to make me healthy and what, what's going to allow me to live the longest life is um, definitely keeps me up. I had a very unusual childhood in that I grew up, I grew up on Stanford campus and I never moved. And, um, it, and, and almost all, like, you know, 80% of my kindergarten class is all still friends. And so I have to say it's a lot of, it's, it's the people on my street 
um, who, you know, my next door neighbor is this guy, George Danzig, who's, who passed away a few years ago. But he was, um, you know, he was 90 and he sued Stanford because he wanted to keep teaching. And, um, you know, he, he had the same beat up car and, um, and his house was cluttered with books and stuff. And he would write me long letters about, you know, he was actually really interested in genetics and, and the biotech industry and how that was the next big area. But people like that who are just so interested in the world. And, um, and I have to say, I, I, I was lucky to live in, in an area where I was surrounded by such great people. And, um, and those people really made me. So, um, you know, it's a lot of local heroes, but, but it's, the, it's the people who impacted me the most. The worst advice I probably ever got is when I, um, I was done with Wall Street in 2000. I took off a year to travel. I was going to go um, to med school, and, um, and I got a job offer to go back to Wall Street. And, and I kind of did it probably mostly just, I was like, well, it's, I can make enough money to pay for med school. It will be easy. And, and everyone was really supportive of that. And, and I think that when you have, you know, Wall Street was sort of at the height of the fame, everyone thought it was really cool. And I think doing, taking that job was probably um, the biggest, mis doing something, doing something probably more for the money was probably the worst thing I think I've ever done. When I was investing in it and then I would complain nonstop, like I'm investing in this industry that I feel like is just churning out um, products that are not going to necessarily benefit us. Um, it was actually Larry Page who, who said, you know, at one point he was so irritated, he's like, just stop, if, it, if you're going to keep complaining, just then go and do something, go and fix it. And, and it was really, I was like, wow, yeah, you're right, like I should stop complaining and I should just try to fix it. And, and I think having that mentality, it's so easy to be in a work situation where you complain and, and fundamentally, it's, it's your responsibility. And if you want to make, that's, it's the really fun thing about starting the company. If you want to change this world, this community that we all live in, then, you know, get up and do it and, and just start something. And if it fails, you know, every time we get criticized, I was like, well, that's great. That means I'm actually doing something and I'm pushing buttons. And so every time there's something critical, I feel proud. So. Mm -hmm.